This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Deborah Lynn, Northern Lower Michigan, March 2007. Jude the Obscure by Thomas Hardy. Part 5th, 7. From that week Jude Fawley and Sue walked no more in the town of Aldbrickham. Whither they had gone nobody knew, chiefly because nobody cared to know. Anyone sufficiently curious to trace the steps of such an obscure pair might have discovered without great trouble that they had taken advantage of his adaptive craftsmanship to enter on a shifting, almost nomadic life which was not without its pleasantness for a time. Wherever Jude heard of free stonework to be done, thither he went, choosing by preference places remote from his old haunts and sues. He laboured at a job, long or briefly, till it was finished, and then moved on. Two whole years and a half passed thus. Sometimes he might have been found shaping the mullions of a country mansion, sometimes setting the parapet of a town hall. Sometimes Ashlering and Hotel at Sandburn, sometimes a museum at Casterbridge, sometimes as far down as Exonbury, sometimes at Stoke Bear Hills. Later still he was at Kennet Bridge, a thriving town not more than a dozen miles south of Marygreen, this being his nearest approach to the village where he was known, for he had a sensitive dread of being questioned as to his life and fortunes by those who had been acquainted with him during his ardent young manhood of study and promise, and his brief and unhappy married life at that time. At some of these places he would be detained for months, at others only a few weeks. His curious and sudden antipathy to ecclesiastical work, both episcopal and nonconformist, which had risen in him when suffering under a smarting sense of misconception, remained with him in cold blood, less from any fear of renewed censure than from an ultra-conscientiousness which would not allow him to seek a living out of those who would disapprove of his ways. Also, too, from a sense of inconsistency between his former dogmas and his present practice, hardly a shred of the beliefs with which he had first gone up to Christminster now remaining with him. He was mentally approaching the position which Sue had occupied when he first met her. On a Saturday evening in May, nearly three years after Arabella's recognition of Sue and himself at the agricultural show, some of those who there encountered each other met again. It was the spring fair at Kennetbridge, and though this ancient trade meeting had much dwindled from its dimensions of former times, the long straight street of the borough presented a lively scene about midday. At this hour a light trap, among other vehicles, was driven into the town by the north road and up to the door of a temperance inn. There alighted two women, one the driver, an ordinary country person, the other a finely built figure in the deep mourning of a widow. Her sombre suit of pronounced cut caused her to appear a little out of place in the medley and bustle of a provincial fair. "'I will just find out where it is, Annie,' said the widow lady to her companion, when the horse and cart had been taken by a man who came forward, "'and then I'll come back and meet you here, and we'll go in and have something to eat and drink. I begin to feel quite a sinking.' "'With all my heart,' said the other, "'though I would sooner have put up at the Checkers or the Jack. "'You can't get much at these temperance houses. "'Now don't you give way to gluttonous desires, my child,' "'said the woman in weeds reprovingly. "'This is the proper place. "'Very well. "'We'll meet in half an hour "'unless you come with me to find out "'where the site of the new chapel is. "'I don't care to. "'You can tell me.' The companions then went their several ways, the one in crape walking firmly along with a mien of disconnection from her miscellaneous surroundings. Making inquiries, she came to a hoarding, within which were excavations denoting the foundations of a building, and on the boards without, one or two large posters announcing that the foundation stone of the chapel, about to be erected, would be laid that afternoon at three o'clock by a London preacher of great popularity among his body. Having ascertained thus much, 
the immensely weeded widow retraced her steps and gave herself leisure to observe the movements of the fair by and by her attention was arrested by a little stall of cakes and gingerbreads standing between the more pretentious erections of trestles and canvas it was covered with an immaculate cloth and tended by a young woman apparently unused to the business she being accompanied by a boy with an octogenarian face who assisted her upon my senses murmured the widow to herself his wife sue if she is so she drew nearer to the stall how do you do mrs fawley she said blandly sue changed colour and recognised arabella through the crape veil how are you mrs cartlett she said stiffly and then perceiving arabella's garb her voice grew sympathetic in spite of herself what you have lost my poor husband yes he died suddenly six weeks ago leaving me none too well off though he was a kind husband to me but whatever profit there is in public housekeeping goes to them that brew the liquors and not to them that retail them and you my little old man you don't know me i expect yes i do you be the woman i thought were my mother for a bit till i found you wasn't replied father time who had learned to use the wessex tongue quite naturally by now all right never mind i am a friend Jewy said sue suddenly go down to the station platform with this tray there's another train coming in i think when he was gone arabella continued he'll never be a beauty will he poor chap does he know i am his mother really no he thinks there is some mystery about his parentage that's all jude is going to tell him when he is a little older but how do you come to be doing this i am surprised it is only a temporary occupation a fancy of ours while we are in a difficulty then you are living with him still yes married of course any children two and another coming soon i see sue writhed under the hard and direct questioning and her tender little mouth began to quiver lord i mean goodness gracious what is there to cry about some folks would be proud enough it is not that i am ashamed not as you think but it seems such a terribly tragic thing to bring beings into the world so presumptuous that i question my right to do it sometimes take it easy my dear but you don't tell me why you do such a thing as this jude used to be a proud sort of chap above any business almost leave alone keeping a standing perhaps my husband has altered a little since then i am sure he is not proud now and sue's lips quivered again i am doing this because he caught a chill early in the year while putting up some stonework of a music hall at quarter shot which he had to do in the rain the work having to be executed by a fixed day he is better than he was but it has been a long weary time we have had an old widow friend with us to help us through it but she's leaving soon well i am respectable too thank god and of a serious way of thinking since my loss why did you choose to sell gingerbreads that's a pure accident he was brought up to the baking business and it occurred to him to try his hand at these which he can make without coming out of doors we call them christminster cakes they are a great success i never saw any like em why they are windows and towers and pinnacles and upon my word they are very nice she had helped herself and was unceremoniously munching one of the cakes yes they are reminiscences of the christminster colleges traceried windows and cloisters you see it was a whim of his to do them in pastry still harping on christminster even in his cakes laughed arabella just like jude a ruling passion what a queer fellow he is and always will be sue sighed and she looked her distress at hearing him criticized don't you think he is come now you do though you are so fond of him of course christminster is a sort of fixed vision with him which i suppose he'll never be cured of believing in he still thinks it a great centre of high and fearless thought instead of what it is a nest of commonplace schoolmasters whose characteristic is timid obsequiousness to tradition arabella was quizzing sue with more regard of how she was speaking than of what she was saying 
"'How odd to hear a woman selling cakes talk like that,' she said. "'Why don't you go back to school-keeping?' She shook her head. "'They won't have me.' "'Because of the divorce, I suppose. "'That and other things. "'And there is no reason to wish it. "'We gave up all ambition, "'and were never so happy in our lives till his illness came. "'Where are you living?' "'I don't care to say. "'Here in Kennetbridge?' Sue's manner showed Arabella that her random guess was right. "'Here comes the boy back again,' continued Arabella. "'My boy and Jude's.' Sue's eyes darted a spark. "'You needn't throw that in my face,' she cried. "'Very well, though I half feel as if I should like to have him with me. "'But, Lord, I don't want to take him for me. "'Ever I should sin to speak so profane. "'Though I should think you must have enough of your own.' He's in very good hands, that I know, and I am not the woman to find fault with what the Lord has ordained. I've reached a more resigned frame of mind. Indeed, I wish I had been able to do so. You should try, replied the widow, from the serene heights of a soul conscious not only of spiritual, but of social superiority. I make no boast of my awakening, but I'm not what I was. After Cartlett's death I was passing the chapel in the street next ours, and went into it for shelter from a shower of rain. I felt a need of some sort of support under my loss, and, as t'was righter than gin, I took to going there regular, and found it a great comfort. But I've left London now, you know, and at present I am living at Alfredston with my friend Annie, to be near my own old country. I'm not come here to the fair to-day. There's to be the foundation stone of a new chapel laid this afternoon by a popular London preacher, and I drove over with Annie. Now I must go back to meet her. Then Arabella wished Sue good-bye and went on. End of Part Fifth Seven